we don't say anything that we that we that was really important before we actually started recording so what i do this is called circle up and get real and the premise of the podcast i don't know if you've had a chance to listen to any of them is that um we get real about who the humans are and not just the resources i'm really committed to building the humanity of the world uh, with what i do and we can talk about that later because i've had some huge ahas in the last week Mm -hmm. about my business so I'm kind oh, of I love excited. it me too by the way really oh well, yeah absolutely feel free to share whatever comes to you there's no real format here I'll ask you about you how you got here how you got to where you are you know a little bit about your background and who you are and then we're just gonna it's free flow I've got your bio that I printed out from your website oh lord okay this is serious well I just want people to know who it is and I and I want you to talk about but just get shit done because I think that is a really important part about who you are and why your business is as successful as it is because you you are uh, an east coaster even though you came from oklahoma mm -hmm. you're an east coaster and i really love that about you and and you know about me it was like whoa when i met you and and was where i was but it's because i've been conditioned and programmed in the midwest in the upper yeah. midwest oh absolutely and and then i you know I, I appreciate that being from the, I, I do not call Oklahoma the Midwest. It's the subject yeah. of much debate and uh, <laughs> yeah. really contentious. People get really mad about it, including me when people call Oklahoma the Midwest. What I finally figured out is that the top of Oklahoma is the Midwest and the bottom of Oklahoma is not. So okay. we can talk about that too, whatever you want to talk yeah, about. I love it. Okay. So I'll do a countdown just for my editing purposes. And then I just start and don't worry about anything because everything is editable. Yeah. Okay. All right. Three two, one. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Circle Up and Get Real, where we talk about things that matter with people who matter. And the secret is that's everybody. So today, I'm really excited to share with you my new friend, Michelle, who I met not that long ago when I was at NLP training, NLP train the trainer training, which was very monumental in many ways for me. Michelle, we can talk about that. Um, just as a little background, and I'll put some of this in your bio as well, but Michelle is the founder of BGSD Strategies, and she's passionate about helping organizational leaders grow their teams quickly while maintaining their health and sanity. I love that. And we can talk more about the details, but I had to look up, Michelle, what BGSD stood for, mm -hmm. and I love it. It's bitches get shit done. And I kind of say that with that emphasis because that seems to me how you would say it. Yeah. <laughs> so Michelle, welcome to Circle Up and Get Real. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you, Jody. Well, I want to know more about Michelle. I also want to know about your business, but I really want to know about you. I I really enjoyed getting to know you. Uh, we spent you and I spent two weeks together. I know you had been at this training for two weeks before that, and then a week after that. So you spent five weeks in San Diego with NLP on the brain. Um, yes. So tell me first about that experience for you, being gone that long and immersing in NLP. What was that like? Uh, well, I am insane for doing that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love efficiency. As we talk more about business, life, et cetera, you're going to hear that thread come out. I love uh, doing everything. So you know how they will tell women all the time, they will tell women, you can't do it all or you can't, or you can have it all, but just not at the same time. I have it all at the same time. I'm that person that says, watch me. Uh, and in service of that, I'm often torturing myself <laughs> in, these, in these new and interesting ways that entertain my friends and family. And this was one of those things where the way that I could get all of this training done in an efficient way was to do it all at once over the summer while my youngest was at summer camp. And it just so happened to line up with the training schedule that I could do that. And so it took about, I will say, a full year of planning in terms of getting my business ready to leave for those really almost six weeks by the time I traveled both ways, et cetera, um, and getting my family ready and just getting everything set up, getting the Airbnb rented for six weeks. And I just thought, you know, I'll just move to San Diego for the summer, basically, and I'll do this. Uh, there were many points during that where I thought, why? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I do this to myself. And I had to remind myself that it was easier actually than trying to break it up into two or three chunks and 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 leave everybody and everything. But because it's not, and I and I and I know that the people listening probably need some context around the this. Yeah. 
these trainings are all day, every day. We're, we're 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week, one day off in between. And, and when you're in the training room, you're sitting in a chair with a manual on your lap. There's no laptop. You can have your phone, but it's pretty rude to be out on your phone. And so it's not just that we're in there the whole day. It's also that we're disconnected from email, from messages, from being able to, you know, emergencies could get through. And there's not a lot you can be doing to maintain your life while you're while you're in there. So it really takes a lot of planning to be able to be completely away and completely immersed for that long. Uh, and, uh, you know, now I'm just uh, getting back into my real life from doing that, you know, ask me in two weeks how, <laughs> whether it was a good idea yeah. <laughs> as, well, we, as we re-engage. It was very intense and it was a great way to get it all at once and get it really hammered in and reinforced because all the concepts are reinforcing each other. And I had nothing else distracting me just thinking about those concepts. I feel like I got really deep learning doing it that way. Yeah. So uh, everybody, you need to know a little bit more about what would take somebody six weeks of their lives to do. What is this training? What is NLP? So let's talk first about NLP and then let's talk about how that relates and works with your business. Absolutely. So what, what about NLP was it that attracted you so much? You know, I'd always heard little rumblings about NLP and just about how effective it is for communication. And I was always interested in it. Uh, Jody, I've been a student of influence my entire life. So I don't know, uh, your listeners don't know this about my background, but I spent the, the vast majority of my career working in politics, working as a political consultant. And then even when I started my management consulting practice, it was around helping political consultants. So I've been immersed in that world uh, in business and in politics, both uh, fields where influential communication is extremely important. And I've always been fascinated by who influences others the most and how do they do it? And it, starting out with being on a politician's team and trying to help a politician win a campaign you know, okay, how do we do that? How do we communicate with voters? How are we most effective? And then going into business and now where my work centers largely around management and leadership, how can we be effective communicators at work? How can we be effective communicators in terms of marketing? Um, and then with NLP, how can we be effective communicators with ourselves first? Mm -hmm. Because what I've been learning and, and really reinforcing so deeply, especially over the last year is it all starts here. I have to be really clear and congruent with myself communicating internally before I'm going to have any type of external communication congruently with my team, with my family, and then out onto you know a marketing platform, something like that. So really thinking of it from, as a concentric circle thing with the bullseye in the middle, starting with you, I feel like NLP has been invaluable for learning how to deal with myself mm -hmm. uh, before I learn how to communicate effectively with others. So we got into this a little, I'll say randomly, uh, our head mindset coach, Mo Poole, I'll put a big plug in for Mo. She's a fantastic coach. I'm so happy, happy, happy to work with her, have her on my team. She signed up for an NLP training for her birthday with her best friend. And she came to a staff meeting and said, FYI, I'm going to be out for four days at the end of this month for my birthday. I'm going to this NLP training. And I just rudely invited myself. I said, uh, I've always wanted to learn NLP. I'm coming with you. Let's go celebrate your birthday in Austin. I'll, hey, everybody, I'm going to be out too <laughs> with Mo. And we went and we, and this is like, this is June of 2021. Okay. Uh, and once we got in there, we just both, we were, oh, this is, this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. We signed up for master practitioner level in November. We both went, uh, I, uh, she completed the two weeks. Then I was able, only able to complete one because of a death in my family. We got enough there that we started coming back and us using it with our clients. Mm -hmm. The results with our clients immediately were insane. So we used to, I mean, we've been coaching for years. Mm -hmm. uh, we were coaching, I'll say the old fashioned way. That's how I, that's the frame in my mind with a lot of logical reframing. We did a lot of reframing, a lot of positive thinking, a lot of, oh, you, it's not that you have to, you get to positive mm -hmm. languaging, things like that. It was taking us sometimes six or nine months to get through to a client who was afraid to do something. I'm afraid to hire somebody. I'm afraid to borrow the money that my business needs, whatever it is that they're trying to get over the bridge. Repetition, coaching, reframing constantly for months and months 
before they would finally take a leap and do that thing that would make the next big difference in their business. We would get it. It was a lot of work. Yeah. When we started to incorporate NLP, things that took six or nine months before happened in 24 hours. What? 24 hours? This is where we would do a breakthrough session. Somebody would shift and immediately the behavior is different. Immediately they're taking those actions that are necessary. Th those actions that are understandably scary for people, but necessary to move a business forward quickly and then getting those outcomes so much faster. And we, we probably experimented with it for one or two months before it was so clear that, okay, we have to roll this into everything that we do. Now, all of our management consulting engagements, traditionally business strategy engagements, these are spreadsheet heavy things, Jody. Yeah. Now include a mindset component with NLP because it doesn't matter what's on the spreadsheet if someone's afraid to do what the spreadsheet tells them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so true. So your business was successful before this. Yeah. It just took longer, it sounds like. It was a little um, more intense, maybe, what you had to do as coaches and consultants. Yeah. Now it feels like what you've said is the results that the clients are getting are happening faster, which makes your um, your influence and your coaching even more valuable to them. Yes, more valuable to them. And, and, and I love the concept, by the way, of more for same or same mm -hmm. for less when it comes to people that are struggling, right? What can we do to continually add value into our current packages? We're not, you know, charging more for this we are rolling it in because it makes everything more effective and it's a win-win for us as a business too because it's more efficient on our side we were getting those results before through elbow grease whatever the the the, the mental equivalent of elbow grease is yeah we're committed to our clients we're going to work as hard as it takes as long as it takes to get the outcome we were doing that and we were working extremely hard at it especially during covid when mm -hmm obviously worrying about our business every our clients are all in small business all of our clients panicking at once we had you know we're working parents they're all working parents trying to navigate the, the kids at school every it was just a lot and we got through it by sheer force of will commitment and hard work this comes in and now it's oh we can do the same thing working smarter not harder and because of that we're more efficient and we can service more people with the same outcome. So it's, it's, it's amazing what it's already doing for the business uh, and what it's doing for us because it's allowing us to have better work-life balance. And as a boss, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but as a boss, I'm very proud of the fact that I retained my entire staff all the way through COVID, all the way up now. And a large part of that was the fact that we treat people so well and everybody's got the balance that they need at our company. This helps with that so much. So, okay, so there's a lot to unpack in that. You, you, you are oh, such yeah. a great communicator. And I know that from being in your group and that you give so much information so succinctly, yet there's a lot packed in. So I want to just back up a little bit and unpack some of that. Yeah. So NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming, for those of you who might not know that. And what it's 40 years, at least the organization you and I are part of is 40 years old, celebrating the 40th anniversary now. And so this is not something that's fly by night. This is not something that's, you know, magic sauce, although it feels like it kind of, doesn't it? When you can get results in 24 hours. It really does. It, it almost is. Uh, did that actually just happen? Did that actually work? Uh, because it's so crazy to the logical conscious mind that something could shift so quickly. Yeah. So you, I know you were raised in, we were having a dialogue about whether it's the Midwest or not in Oklahoma, which yes, um, being from North Dakota, I wouldn't consider that the Midwest. I don't either. I'm from the, I'm from Southern Oklahoma. Southern Oklahoma. So yes. in that, uh, the way you were raised there, um, I'm just making an assumption. Um, for me, it was about hard work. It yes. work has to be hard. And if it's yes. not, then you're not doing it right. Yes. And with the Bible Belt component to that, so much of that is tied up in the, you know, you need to have meaningful full vocation in your life. You need to keep busy. I grew up, I don't know if you did, Jody. I grew up hearing idle hands are the devil's playground. Yes, yes, yes. And work being not just this is the way that you get successful. That wasn't even what the value was. The value was this is how you stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. And this is how you are a uh, an individual that that contributes to society. This is how you create meaning in your life. This is how you uh, are a good example to your children who should have these same values that it's, it's work for work's sake. Yes. Because work is good for the soul. 
there's a lot of that that I that I still believe. And then of course there's some nuance to it that I that I, I love unpacking. Yeah. And I bet as a management consultant and who works with small businesses, helping them be healthy not only on the balance sheet. But also, it sounds like their whole lives balance you were talking about. Uh, I'm betting that the best way you can do that is to be the example first. You kind of alluded to that, saying that your team has stayed together despite all of uh, the challenges we've all had. And now that, uh, together with NLP, gives you a whole, I guess I would say, a wider spectrum of offerings for your clients. So can you go back and tell me how you got here, how you got to uh, B, BGSD? Uh, yeah. Because it, that wasn't where you started, right? What what did you do before? Just, were, uh, just, just starting from the beginning and working. Well, yeah. I mean, who are you? You were in Oklahoma. Who and, am I? I ask yeah. myself that every day in the mirror, Jody. Uh, I was in Oklahoma. Yeah, I grew up there, birth to 18 in Lawton, Oklahoma. Just in case anybody from Lawton, Oklahoma is listening, I'm trying to represent you well out here in the wider world. Grew up in Lawton, Oklahoma and left three days after my 18th birthday. I, I, I was, I felt as a teen, you know, and, and it's funny now I have a teen. So it's yeah. as a teen, I was very, oh, I have to get out into the, the big city where my talents will be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stay in this town. And, uh, and, and, and I left to the point that, so I got into undergrad at UT Dallas, got a full scholarship there. I, I, we didn't grow up with a lot. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was, you know, my mom told me very frankly, she's a Frank woman, uh, if you want to go to college, you need to get a scholarship. Otherwise, we're going to have to do a second mortgage or something like that. There's not this money for you to just go wherever. Mm-hmm. Um, try. So I, I got a full ride to UT Dallas, totally paid tuition. They even paid some of my housing. It, it was wonderful. And I was able to enroll in a summer class. I enrolled in one summer class, which allowed me to move down there and stay on campus. So three days after my 18th birthday, I was, I was down in Dallas. Now, Dallas was the big city to me. It is. It's a big city. It is. Yeah. And to me, it was the, the big city. Yeah. Um, three and a half hours away from my home. It felt like I was in a whole different world. Yeah. And I, I loved going to UT Dallas. I, I will plug UT Dallas uh, to the moon and back. Uh, I studied political science there. I made lots of friends. I was in a sorority, vice president of the sorority. I mean, it was a, it's a nerdy school. Mm. UT Dallas known for its chess team, by the way, okay. nationally recognized <laughs> chess team, no football team. Okay. When I say no football team, you being from North Dakota, you might understand how important that is. East Coasters, so what? When you're in the middle of the country, yeah, that's you bet it is to yep. go to a college in Texas with no football team. People, what are <laughs> what are you even doing? I was going to a school of nerds, mm-hmm. and as a nerd, I was able to thrive there. I was cool there. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's relative. <laughs> I was cool. I was in the sorority. I, I not. I wouldn't have been at a different school. Right, right, right. So I was able to blossom and thrive, and in political science. I got eventually recruited to come out to DC as part of a UT pilot program called the Archer Center, Mm. which was bringing people from the UT system, students from the UT system to DC to intern and have a semester experience there. And it was only the second semester that they were doing that. They had started at UT Austin, the major UT school, and then they had just expanded to UT Dallas. And so they said, would you like to go and do your semester in DC? And I said, well, I can't. I'm vice president of my sorority, <laughs> and <laughs> they need me. Yeah. I was eventually convinced to go out to D.C. The rest is a little bit history. I I, I love D.C. I loved politics. I immediately began interning in political media consulting, which is making political ads, the TV ads. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Went out on campaigns after that. Ended up back in D.C. making political ads. And just took off from there. Wow. It wasn't until I had my oldest son, and I was 24 when I had my oldest son, because that's what people from Oklahoma do. You all know I'm saying that with love. I'm one of you. Uh, <laughs> I felt like an old maid, by the way, having my first kid at 24. I thought, <laughs> I thought oh wow, I've really waited way too long. Wow. Meanwhile, everyone on the East Coast is is reacting with horror, as if I'm, you know, a, a pregnant 14 year old. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing? Are you going to keep it? You know, all that. 
so I had my first kid at 24 and that's when I thought, okay, I need to do something that actually makes money. Political consulting on the bottom levels. I loved it. No money. Mm. And I had started a political consulting firm as someone's assistant, helping him start the firm and then going up the ranks and becoming really like the operations manager type person at that firm and just fell in love with business and the startup process. He didn't want to deal with any of the details of the business. And because I worked for him and needed a paycheck, he said, you figure all that out. And I said, uh, okay. Wow. <laughs> and I, st- I got some little books and I started reading and I met with the accountants and I, you know, I, I just began learning. And this was the first time, Jody, that the concept entered into my awareness that you can make money with money. Oh. I had never had money. I didn't grow up mm-hmm. with money. Mm-hmm. And when we talk about the, the values that we were raised with, and sounds like a lot of them were shared, mm-hmm. one of those cultural uh, quirks is that there's not a lot of intergenerational sharing of money. There's not a lot of money anyway. And there's a high value on independence. Mm-hmm. I grew up hearing when you're 18, you're out. When you're 18, you're on your own over and over and over. And it wasn't, you know, hey, uh, we've saved up all this money to help yeah. you. That, that wasn't a thing. Yeah. And everybody does really well. And then they keep it. I didn't know anything about my parents' finances. That wasn't transparent. And, and that's not just my family. That mm-hmm. was everyone around. It was you do your, you do you. Right, right, right. You do you. And so going and learning, this is kind of the rich dad, poor dad stuff, going yeah. and learning from, I started with Susie Orman, love Susie mm-hmm. Orman, you know, yeah, just yeah. at the bottom level of understanding basic personal finance. Oh my gosh money makes money. Mm -hmm. This became fascinating to me in a gamified way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I can attribute a lot of my success to is having a healthy detachment from money because I never had any. Mm -hmm. And so it was very much when I could get it, it felt like a game and it felt, and and to this day, it still feels like, and if it's gone, so what? Because I lived so long without it. I know how to live on $10 a week, you know, jar of peanut butter, bag of rice, and some beans and you're good to go. I, I would eat peanut butter with a spoon. I called it a peanut butter popsicle <laughs> <laughs> when I was in my twenties and broke. And, you know, like, I, like I, I have that confidence that comes from, I know I'm okay, no matter what, I know I can take care of myself. So the money became like a game and I started learning how to make money with money. And when I had my first kid and I wasn't making enough money and we were broke, I decided I needed to go to business school. Okay. And I decided that it was not going to be worthwhile for me to go to business school unless I went to a top 10 business school. And I did my research of the top 10 programs and what was family friendly, what would be a good place to go. And I found out that the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth is in Hanover, New Hampshire, in a very small town setting. There's a very family feel to it. And I thought that's where I want to go. Wow. I only had... Not, it's not even that I had the money. I only even was able to get enough money. I borrowed $1,500 from my mother-in-law at the time. Wow. I was only able to get enough money to apply to the one school by the time, because you, you know, in business school interviews, you fly up there, you do an interview, you wow. need a suit, you know, the application fees, 350. This mm. is stuff that, you know, when you're really broke and you're living on peanut butter popsicles, yeah. I, I was doing that budget. And I thought, well, I'll apply early. And then if I don't get in, I'll, I'll figure out the next step. I'll still have time to figure out how to apply. And I, but luckily I did get in. Uh, they said, we need $3,000 to hold your spot. I cashed out my 401k, wow. 26 years old. Guess how much money was in it, Jody? $3,000. $3,000. Oh my God. That's so <laughs> Took the penalty said, here you go. They said, what else are you going to put? And I said, eh, that you said 3,000. I got 3,000. Here you go. Let me in. Wow. Let me borrow the rest. And that's really where that, you know, major, major shifts happen. Obviously mm-hmm. became a whole different person as a result of that. That was the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life mm-hmm. for many reasons. It's so funny, Jody, because the training we were just in, I kept hearing people say, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I was struggling. I mean, I know I sound like an asshole. I'm about to say it anyway. I was really <laughs> struggling not to roll my eyes because I'm like, gosh, after working campaigns and sleeping on air mattresses with guys that were jerks all around me, after going to business school as a single mom, uh, this is not anywhere near the hardest thing I've right. ever done. In my right. life. It, was, it was intense. It was not not to that level. Yeah, I am yeah. so grateful to have had those super difficult, super intense, super challenging 
experience is they do put other things in perspective and they did install so much confidence in me in terms of what I'm actually capable of doing when I put my mind to something and dig really deep. Well, and that's evident to me having met you just recently and spending any time with you because your energy is very magnetic and you are very confident in the way you assert yourself in uh, the way you be. And so what I learned um, just being around you is uh, reinforced what I know about modeling being the best teacher. And if it's true that the business you are running right now is because you are modeling it and you've already kind of alluded to the fact that your people are staying with you and your business is growing despite whatever we've gone through in the last few years, that is a tribute to you and your, um, to me, it's just like a, a, it is what it is. I just do this. It isn't that I have to think about how hard it is or what, we're just finding ways to work smarter, not harder. I, yeah, and there's stuff to unpack there too. I want to be really clear with your listeners that I didn't just show up this amazing model of all of these things. I've, I've been, I, I have been and remain a work in progress. And this is, is still something that I'm working on because I will work myself to death mm -hmm. and I'm getting to an age, I'm 41, I'm getting to an age where even just physically my body is saying no. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not physically able to work the way I did when I was 25 mm -hmm. and I don't want to. And I didn't show up as a perfect model of this. And my philosophy coming in was always uh, I'll pick up the slack, you know, this, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I want to highlight this because this is a stage that so many business owners go through. And I, and I, and I know some of the people listening will, will relate to this and say, or even that's where I am right now. And so I want to talk about it. I showed up thinking, obviously I have these progressive values. I'm so happy by the way, to be able to talk out loud about politics again. Uh, <laughs> I didn't feel like that was cool. <laughs> Where we were, I am a, a dyed in the wool progressive. I, anyone that Googles me is gonna see pictures of me holding up protest signs. They're gonna see years and years worth of progressive views. I'm a liberal, I'm a lefty, proud, proud to represent. Um, and, and, and a progressive capitalist, which makes me a little bit of a weirdo. We could talk about that. Yeah. And I always came in with these values of if I'm going to have employees, they're going to be paid market rates or higher. They're going to have benefits. They're going to have time off when I, and that's not a normal or popular thing to do when you're starting out. A lot of advisors will say, oh, you know, work with all contractors so you don't have to pay benefits. And, um, oh, you can hire at this, this lower rate because you're just starting people out. And I always tried to do my best to make sure that my people were set up. It's always been a huge point of pride for me to be a job creator and to provide good jobs, healthy jobs. In service of that, in the beginning, I would kill myself mm -hmm. working 60, 70 hours a week, not taking lunch breaks. So I was not being a good model. And I want to stress that. Yeah. I was showing up and saying, everybody else take their time off and, and, and have a good balance. And, and don't worry, I'll, I'll handle it. I'll get it. I'll, it felt heroic and self-sacrificial at the time. I now feel like it was neither of those things and that it's actually pretty fucked up mm -hmm. and a terrible thing to do to myself, a terrible thing to model for people, uh, and a little bit control freaky, a lot control freaky. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a stage that, that owners go through. Don't worry, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. It's a great way to burn yourself out, to create a terrible model for your employees and freak them out thinking that they shouldn't be taking lunch breaks or they should be working all the time. It's a good way to trap yourself in your business because you can't leave when you're the one that has to do everything at the end of the day. Yeah. The last few years, my work in progress has really been focused on undoing a lot of that damage that I did to myself and my business by defaulting to don't worry, I got it. Yeah, yeah, totally yeah. get that. And I love how you said that sometimes that makes us feel heroic, because I'll take care of it. I've got it. Um, and and you're not then I thank you for clearing that up you're not modeling what you really truly desire for them you're mothering them more than anything it sounds like that's exactly right there are so many people that I have as clients that will be afraid to hire people because their representation of what it takes to be a boss is is apparent mm -hmm. uh, they'll say things like I can't be responsible for other people and I will remind them that these are adults that have other job options. It's definitely not the same as having children. If I'm talking to someone who is a parent, it's easier because I can say, this isn't, you are responsible for your physical, actual, biological children. The people that are 
in your care that are under 18, you are not responsible for your employees in that same way. Your responsibility to your employees is to be transparent enough about the business situation. If this is a startup and I'm hiring you with three months of runway for your salary, yes, absolutely an integrity to say that, hey, I'd love you to take a risk with me. Here's what I've got. Here's what we need to do to make sure that this keeps going. At that point, if somebody says, yes, I would love to work for you in this situation, they're making an adult consensual decision. You've given them the information they need. So you're not their mama or their daddy. Mm -hmm. yep. That's, you know, and, and it's a really important boundary to be able to hold. Otherwise people, they're, they're too scared to do it in the first place. Or when they do hire, they're torturing themselves, feeling, taking on responsibility that isn't theirs for somebody else's life. Well, and because uh, going back to what you said then, because then the model that they've been following is somebody who works 80 hours a week and does that, even though you were doing that so they didn't have to, they're looking up and seeing the model again. And, and I love that distinction that you're pointing out by being transparent enough to share your own experience of what not to do in a way. So even as you're, you say you were a work in progress, you're still showing that um, personal development is a huge part of any kind of business as an owner or as a, a COO of, of somebody else's organization mm -hmm. too. And I love that about this. So you went from being a political in, in the polit political world to now having your own business where do you work a lot with politicians or politics or is it business in general? We work a lot with politics. We're now one uh, one concentric circle removed because we work with the companies who work with politicians and work on campaigns. This just started as a natural extension of my network being political consultants. And also because I, once I got back into the industry after business school with my MBA, it became apparent how screwed up a lot of the businesses were. When you think about what it takes to successfully run a campaign versus what it takes to successfully run a business, in some aspects, these are wildly different things. And so you have a bunch of people who are coming off of campaigns who are amazing at winning campaigns, starting businesses and trying to apply the same skill sets that made them successful in the campaign arena to business with disastrous results. Mm -hmm. you know, in a campaign, let's say you're six weeks out from election day. That means I have six weeks to spend all the money Mm -hmm. because it doesn't do any good after election day right, right? right i have i need to get squeeze the juice out of my 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 staff and my volunteers get all the labor out of them you know we've all got to push knowing that they're going to be on vacation for two months afterwards mm -hmm. after the election you know it's just this it's so cyclical mm -hmm. and when you start when you come into a and, and and you think of a campaign as having a budget right mm -hmm. here's how much money we have how can we spend it most effectively to win mm -hmm. at this discrete period you bring that into a business and all of a sudden, these people are spending all the money really fast in the business. They are yelling at their staff and, and oh, yeah. trying to get them to work 80 hours. It, things that are not sustainable when you're trying to build something that's going to last, hopefully, you know, 10, 20 years. Sure. And so it became apparent, hey, here is an opportunity to actually help. I was getting asked, even though I was working for other agencies at, the, at that time, I was getting, can you help me with my business? Can you help me figure this out? I was one of the only people with an MBA floating around on the progressive side. There's some Republicans with MBAs, uh -huh. uh, but on the on the Democrat side in the industry, and people started to get wind of this and ask me to help. And I realized this is a whole consultancy. Mm -hmm. It was really the 2016 election that you know I was in my fields just like everybody else on our side, and I was, gosh, what can I do to help? Gosh, when's the adult going to show up and tell me what to do? to help and realizing I'm the adult, I need to figure it out. And just the place that I can be the most efficient and effective is helping these organizations run more efficiently so that they can focus on doing their work because they're not business people. Mm. How can I teach them to be business people just a little bit, just enough that they're not having to stop what they're doing on the campaigns to put out business fires constantly. And this is how I can indirectly help the movement. Oh, I love that. So it reminds me of uh, the infinite game. Are you familiar with um, Simon mm -hmm. Sinek's infinite game? Because the infinite game doesn't have an end where a campaign definitely has a has an end. It's a finite game. Mm -hmm. And if we're running finite games with finite mindsets, that's going to give us a, a, some result. 
And if we're running infinite games with finite mindsets, that's not great either. And right. so thinking about that, all the combinations of that, I love that you're bringing an awareness to these people who have been in a finite game trying to win something. You said they spend all the money quickly and they yell at their people because that's what you do in a finite game. There's an end result. Yeah, and, and, I'm, and I'm generalizing. And, and, well, and, and, no, it's, I get it. I, the, the, the campaign, well, I, I have to say this uh, because I, I want to give credit where credit's due. Yeah. The campaign role has gotten much, much better, especially over the last few years where a lot of awareness has been brought to this. We've got a lot of folks unionizing and in, in, in campaign land and things like that. And, and it's not nearly what it was when I was doing campaigns in you know, 2002, 2003. Uh, things have gotten much better. And this is still true. I will say it's still a finite game. It's just a longer game. Mm. We're always looking at the exit strategy, the exit plan, but we're looking at what's, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years out. Mm -hmm. yep. And we're still planning to that. It's just the longer game has different rules for sure. It sure does. And I love that you said that because uh, many startups, in my experience too, do have that in mind. They want to get sold at some point. They're building something that can be sellable and they are thinking of an exit strategy. I've also been working with manufacturing organizations that have are generations old. Yeah. No interest in ever. So happening. interesting. So then it's got to be an infinite mindset because you want to keep it for your grandkids and for yeah. whomever will come after. So there's this really interesting play and trying to use one mindset with a different um, game really that's what people get messed up i think and that's where you find what you described as you know yelling and and working in something that would work in a, a gamification uh, a yeah. football game doesn't yeah. work when running a manufacturing organization for the long haul yeah we've just got to burn out all the resources as quickly as possible versus we need to be sustainable here and as we so still about a quarter of our business comes from political consultants we we have expanded out and now work with all types of businesses. I will say we still mostly work with service businesses. I get very excited when we get a product business every once in a while. Most of the time it's it's a service type of business and we're in all different types of industries with all different types of focus. The the shared thread being these are people who feel called to help create a better world who generally share progressive values, uh, who want to do things not just in a monetary growth way, which yes is very important, Right. Also in a personal growth way, also in a team growth way, also in a taking care of themselves and others way, getting to work with different types of business models is so fascinating to me. I'm a nerd. And so that's, you saw me light up, uh, you all listening can't see me, but I lit up when Jody said generational manufacturing businesses. And I said, Ooh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I haven't ever worked with a generational manufacturing business. I think that would be so fascinating to come in and, and, and think about how that affects all of the planning differently when we're used to thinking about how do we exit in 10 years? Yeah, well, that's the difference when you have a consultant or a business. Uh, do you consider yourself a consultant for businesses sure. yeah. who would come in um, being curious and being open? It's different from somebody who comes in and says, I already know everything. I'm going to tell you what I know and isn't open to what you and I both have learned through NLP going back to how we started this conversation. Yeah. It's all about communication. NLP is all about communication. And in my observation, looking back with the information I now have, every problem, I, that's a sweeping generalization, but every problem I look back on could have been solved or at least helped with better communication. Oh, a hundred percent. And curiosity. I love that you, one of the reasons I loved you immediately was your be curious right. necklace. Yeah, necklace. And because I, it, it's been a tenant of mine for a long time, curiosity is a cure. Ooh, I think we just are on the verge of making go. something Ooh. else up. Oh, wait, write I that one like down. <laughs> curiosity is a cure for a lot of conflict, a lot of upset in business, in personal life, even with yourself. Getting curious, what's really going on here? Digging down is yeah. so key to success in all of this. That's one of the things that I learned in sales a long time before I learned NLP. I didn't realize it was one of the tenets of NLP. But when I saw it, I thought, oh, I'm so aligned with this. This is so true because it, 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 it never serves you to go in knowing everything. Hmm. Now, is there a point when you switch into an authority frame and you say, okay, now I have enough information. Now I know, and here's what needs to happen. Yes, 
that's really important as a consultant to take the reins when you're ready. Right, There's right. always a phase before that, though, of digging the information up that you need, getting curious, eliciting what you need to know qualitatively. I'm trying not to speak nerd, sorry. Uh, <laughs> conversation. Yes. And yes. also numbers wise, data wise, et cetera analyzing that all of that with curiosity so that you can get to a place where you have the certainty to say okay here's what needs to happen based on my analysis based on my experience based on my education my expertise etc here's what we're going to do people yeah. are hiring a consultant to come in and, and and tell them what to do right and and so there's a there's a balance between being able to step into that role confidently with certainty and not showing up like that before mm. you even ask any questions or yes, so out well it, i learned one time connect before you correct yes and if you don't do that connection piece we're going to keep ha having this these cycles of people coming in and people going out and they told me to do this. I didn't believe it, but we paid a lot of money. So we're going to try it. It didn't resonate. And, yeah. and that's the world that I've been observing. And I love your, the, the curiosity. Um, let's, let's put that on hold. Cause you and I are going to talk about that later. Um, cur be curious. So you don't become furious, right? There's curiosity <laughs> or fear, furiousness. And, and I choose curiosity over furious because it's so easy to fall into that space where they're not listening to me. They're not doing what I think they should do because you didn't listen to them up front and yeah. see how, how what they have could benefit from you or not because yeah. perhaps there's not a fit. And that's yeah. the thing. If you come in as a consultant with your hammer, you're going to look for nails all the time and you think everybody, right. But I, I like your uh, philosophy about your business. I mean, you are very, upfront with who you are and um your company's called bitches get shit done <laughs> it is. not everybody who would resonate with that but if you do think about I, i'm reading um on the sheet here grow your team and build sustainability with bgsd we yeah. believe the best way for you to take care of your team is to begin by taking care of yourself yeah. you are modeling that now as you're going through this six weeks of intense training for yourself. Yeah. And when people, your team especially, sees that and resonates with that and, and grows with you that way, it's almost, I, I hate, hesitate to say this, but it's almost a given mm -hmm. that your organization becomes one that other people will be attracted to energetically because yeah. they share your progressive values, your vision for them and with them. And I, I love that you say change can be scary, but what is scarier is not living your life to its potential and mission. Mm -hmm. So if people are interested in having a conversation with you, Michelle, how would they do that? What's the best way to find you? You can go to bgsdstrategies.com and fill out a contact form. You could also go to talktomichelle.com if you want to get on the phone with me and schedule a, a strategy session. I love talking to new people and I do this for free because I love hearing about new people getting new ideas. And because if it's a fit to work together, then that's a conversation that we have on that call. I want to be transparent about that, that that may be the way that call goes. If it's not, then of course I would refer you to whatever I think is the most appropriate thing for you to do next. I always shoot straight with people and tell them what I really think they ought to do and they can take my opinion or, or leave it. It's worth what it costs on a free call for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I love getting on calls with people. I am, you know, Jody, I'm such an extrovert. I love making new friends. I love meeting new people. And when I do these free calls, I, I, that's exactly what I get to do. I get to make new friends, meet new people, hear about new business ideas and, and nerd out for a while. So if you just want to nerd out with me, talk to michelle.com and book something on my calendar and we'll nerd all the way out on it. That's so great. So if you were to say your number one best client for you Mm -hmm. Can you describe that? Who's your avatar? Oh, a hundred percent. I love so much that you asked this question. So my number one best client is going to pass four criteria. And I do talk about this when I talk to people with every individual that I talk to. Uh, the very first thing that they're going to do is they're going to be willing to work their butt off mentally, right? So we say that people freak out. Oh, I can't work hundred hour weeks. No, no, no. We can grow a business in 40 hours a week with a healthy lifestyle around it, for sure. You are going to do mindset work. You are going to work past your blocks. Absolutely, right? So that's one. Okay. The uh, next one is you got to work with integrity. Mm -hmm. 
by my definition, because this is my sandbox, right? And I get to define integrity for my organization. That means we only work with people when we know for uh, for sure, when we have that certainty, we can get the outcome. We're only selling things we're really good at. Mm -hmm. We're honoring contracts that we sign. If we're in politics, we're not trying to play both sides, you know, like integrity, Mm -hmm. super core. Yeah. Third, got to be coachable to work with us. There are people that are great friends that are terrible clients because I it, it's a waste of everybody's time and money for somebody to show up and pay me their money, spend their time, and then not take my advice. Mm-hmm. That makes you mad. It makes me mad. And it wastes. It's just, if you're going to show up and work with us, trust our expertise, mm-hmm. take our advice, implement it. It's not a cult. We're going to show you the spreadsheets. We're going to tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> but coachability is so, so important. And the last one, understanding that you need to invest in a business to grow it. That's that's monetarily, that's energetically. This stuff does not happen by magic. And we have to be willing to do what it takes to go out and get the resources. Doesn't have to be your resources, can be other people's money, can be other people's expertise. But being able to take the risk to leverage the resources that you are able to get that are available to you to invest in growing a business, super key. So if I talk to someone that's not willing to to go there, that's an automatic no-go, right? Integrity, hard work, coachability, willingness to invest. That's who I work best with. So good. So if that's you, or you think that might be you, what is it? Ask Michelle? Talk to Michelle. Talk to Michelle. Talk to Michelle.com and see if this could be something that could help you grow not only your business, but you personally. Actually, it probably goes in the opposite direction. You personally first, because your business will only grow to the extent you do, especially if you are in charge of it. 100%. Michelle, this has been a joy, and I look forward to having many more conversations like this with you. And please, everybody reach out to Michelle. She's going to give you free advice that first call. Why would you not do that if you have any inclination to work on yourself and your business? Go to bgsdstrategies.com and connect with Michelle. Absolutely. So much for being with me. Thank you so much, Jody. Always love to be with you. Take care, everybody. And as always, go be real. See ya. Okay, I'm going to stop recording.